see what God is doing. Um, today, what I've done is I've entitled my message, No Looking Back. No Looking Back. And I'm going to start off today by asking everyone a question. Did you know that there are 170 either uh, women that are either mentioned or alluded to in the Bible, but there's only one woman in the Bible that Jesus tells us to remember? There's only one woman that he tells us to remember. Does anybody know who that woman is? Oops. Okay, you got ahead of me. <laughs> All right. Gene, you and I are going to talk later. God bless you. So, yes, it's Lot's wife, and it's, probably, it's the second shortest verse in the Bible. Does anyone know what the shortest verse in the Bible is? He wept. He wept. Yes, Jesus wept. So, there, that's a little bit of Bible trivia for you to start off the day. But now what we're going to do is I want to move into Luke 17, verses 20 to 23. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Luke chapter 17, verses 20 to 23. And I'm going to be reading this from the New um, Living Translation, okay? So it starts off by saying, One day the Pharisees asked Jesus, When will the kingdom of God come? And Jesus replied, The kingdom of God can't be detected by visible signs. You won't be able to say, Oh, here it is, or hey, it's over there. For the kingdom of God is already among you or it is within you, or it's within your grasp, in other translations. Then he said to his disciples, now note that he's talking to two different types of people here. He saw first he was talking to the Pharisees, now he's talking to his disciples. Who were his disciples? Disciples were believers. Okay? So he says, the time is coming when you will long to see the day when the Son of Man returns, but you won't see it. People will tell you, hey, look over there, the son, there's the Son of Man, or here he is, but don't go out and follow them. For as the lightning flashes and lights up the sky from one end to the other, so it will be on the day when the Son of Man does come, I added it does. But first, the Son of Man must suffer terribly and be rejected by this generation. When the Son of Man returns, it will be like it was in Noah's day. In those days, the people enjoyed banquets and parties and weddings right up to the time Noah entered the boat and the flood came and destroyed them all. And the world will be as it was in the day of Lot. People went about their daily business, eating and drinking, buying and selling, farming and building, until the morning Lot left Sodom. Then fire and burning sulfur rained down from heaven and destroyed them all. Yes, it will be business as usual, right up to the day when the Son of Man is revealed. On that day, a person out on the deck of a roof must not go down into the house to pack. A person out in the field must not return. Remember what happened to Lot's wife. If you cling to your life, you will lose it. And if you let your life go, you will save it. That night, two people will be asleep in one bed. One will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding their flour together at the mill. The one will be taken, and the other will be left. Okay, that's a lot of stuff. So, let's unpack this. Jesus said in verse 32, remember Lot's wife. Now, why Lot's wife? Why not Mary? Why, why not Jesus' mother Mary? I mean, she was a noble woman. She was chosen to be the son, or the, the mother of the Son of God. All right? But he didn't choose her. He didn't say remember Mary. He didn't say remember Mary Magdalene. Mag Mary Magdalene was a a very outstanding woman as well. I mean, she repented and she moved forward in the blessings of God and she had great faith, but he didn't save her. And why not Eve? Well, you know, Eve, we've been, we've been blaming Eve for everything, you know, since the beginning of time, all right? But he didn't mention her. He said, no, he said, remember Lot's wife. 
The only thing that we know about Lot's wife is, is in Genesis 19:26, and it says, "But Lot's wife looked back and became a pillar of salt." Do you know Lot's wife doesn't even have a name? I mean, she did, but we don't even know it. All right, it wasn't even mentioned. It just mentions her as Lot's wife. She looked back and became a pillar of salt. When we think of Sodom and Gomorrah, what sin do we associate with? It's usually sexual sin, right? However, in Ezekiel 16, 49, it says, like, who was actually comparing Jerusalem to Samaria and Sodom, and was saying Jerusalem was actually much worse because of their sin. Can you, did anybody ever pick that up? I didn't until I was studying this. That Jerusalem was actually much worse than Sodom and Gomorrah. I, I think for the most part, we always thought that Sodom and Gomorrah was probably the worst place on earth, right? But that's according to this, according to Ezekiel, no. That God was much more upset with Jerusalem than he was even of Sodom and Gomorrah. If you're not sure about that, read uh, Ezekiel chapter 16. It's very interesting. And so what it says, it says in 16, it says, Sodom's sins were pride, gluttony, and laziness while the poor and needy suffered outside the door. That's what, that's what was mentioned. It mentions a little bit more about that, but that's primarily what Ezekiel was mentioning uh, in comparison to Jerusalem, all right? And a side note, I want to thank Linda and Peggy for stepping up to the plate and for, for actually uh, looking after the food donations to the food bank and City Gate Church for donating to it, uh, because that's the kind of church that we want to be. Amen? We want to be a church of action. It matters to God. It matters to God what we do. It matters to God how our actions <clears throat> matter to Him. We are blessed to be a blessing. I think it was Linda that coined that. At least I don't know where she got it from, but I always give Linda the credit. So <laughs> we are blessed to be a blessing. We are called to be the light in the midst of a broken world. That's what we're called to do. So back to Lot's wife. In Genesis 19, 17, it says, When they were safely out of the city, one of the angels ordered, Run for your lives, and don't look back. Say, don't look back. Don't look back. Or stop anywhere in the valley except to the mount go uh, in the valley escape to the mountains or you will be swept away the angel was saying listen listen things are going to get intense around here okay things are going to get really really bad everything that you once knew is going to be burned up everything you once knew is going to be burned up but don't look back when it happens. But Lot's wife, she looked back, and she became a pillar of salt because she was torn between what God was taking her to and what she was leaving. Okay? Are you following me? She was torn between what God wanted to do in her life and what she was leaving behind. All right? She was more concerned about her past than she was about her future and what God had planned for her. More than the promises of God, more than the provisions of God that laid in front of her. She was looking back. She was stuck in the place where she was only meant to be passing through. She became stuck, calcified, like a pillar of salt. Another word for calcified is hardened, okay? More focused on the issues and things of the past than on God's promises and provisions for her future. That's where her focus was. For some of us, our attachment to the past outweighs our commitment to the future. 
It outweighs our commitment to the future. Some of us are hanging on so tightly to memories of the old blessings that God had in our, or gave us in our lives that we're missing. We're actually missing the new blessings that God has prepared for us in the future. Because we're looking back at everything else that has happened. We're looking back at the good old days. We're looking back at when things were different. We're looking back at the things that we used to like, the things that used to comfort us. And what we're doing is we're missing what God is doing and preparing for us in the future. Okay? We're missing it. Our focus has become inward thinking and we're, we become ineffective to enable God to allow to work in our lives, let alone anyone else's lives around us. All right? How, how do we talk? How do we, what kind of language do we use? Have you ever thought of that? What kind of, what kind of language do you use when you're talking to other people and you're expressing your heart? Do we speak like someone that is stuck in the past or do we speak like someone who is fixed on the promises and the provisions of God for the best for our lives? Which, which is it? Examine what comes out of your heart, all right? Because what's in your heart will eventually come out of your mouth. We all know that. Some of us are stuck in disappointment. Some of us are stuck in discouragement. We're stuck in offense. We're stuck in bitterness. We're stuck in unforgiveness. Those are things that are weighing us down. We're fixed on things that maybe went wrong in the past, like things like who betrayed us, who disappointed us, who hurt us. And those things become the things that we look at, the things that we're always gazing back at. And what's happening in the process is we're not seeing what God is doing right in front of us. We don't see the provisions that God is making for us as we move forward. Why? Because we're too busy looking in the rearview mirror. And we need to take that thing and put it, turn it around. Okay? Fixed on something that we're not meant to face and something fixed on something that we were meant to face and deal with and surrender it to God and then move on. And then move on. Yet here we are in 2024 and we're still stuck in something that we were only meant to be passing through maybe 5, 10, 15, 20 years ago. And we're still there. And we need, to, we, we, we need to look at this. We need to see what God is doing. And our next generation is paying the price. This is why I am so burdened for the next gens. All right? It's for this reason. It's because they desperately need to know and understand this. We need to start showing our next generations how to move forward. Amen? We need to do this. We need to model this. You know, the next generations, our children, our children's children, our grandchildren, in other words, how to trust in God, how to surrender to God. We need to show them this, and especially, like, not just when things are bad, but especially when things are bad in our life. They need to know how to handle situations, and we, can, we, we, we show them by our actions, we show them by our faith. We show them where our trust is in God. If we can't do it, how can we expect our next generation to do it? We need to be able to do it first. We need to be able to lead the way. And I want to speak a word over the next generation right now. I want, I, I want to speak this out. I declare and I decree that you will be better than us that our ceiling will be your floor because I believe that God is going to do something, that he's going to quicken and release this, uh, the, a greater revelation to the next generation and a, a divine purpose for your lives. He's going to release this to you. You are going to move mountains. You are going to set the captives free. You're going to see signs and wonders. And you're going to see healings. And you're going to see growth in the church exponentially. 
and I speak this over the next generation right now, every one of you. This is what God has planned for your life if you are looking forward and trusting him for what he's going to do in your life. All to the praise and the glory of God. Amen? Do you receive this? Next gens, do you receive it? I hope so. Listen to this. The angel of the Lord warned Lot's family, don't look back at what I am burning down. Don't look at what I am finished with. Don't look back at the things that I am delivering you from. Don't look back at those things. They're not worth it. They're done. They're finished. They're in your past. Look forward to the future. But Lot's wife, she looked back and she became a pillar of salt and she became calcified and stuck in that place she was only meant to be passing through. What a sad story. What a sad story. I don't want that to be my story. I don't want to be a pillar of salt. I don't want to be calcified and hardened so much that God cannot use me. I want to be open to what God is doing, and I want to be looking forward. But I want him to be the one who is stepping in front of me, the one who is leading me on, the one who is guiding me and and showing me um, where my steps should be. You see, God is desperately trying to move us. He's trying to move us from where we were maybe are, to where it is that he wants us to be. Why? Because he has a better plan for our lives. He has blessings for us. He wants to open things up for us. But we need to be obedient, and we need to be surrendered to him before he's going to do that. And what that looks like in your life and in my life is going to be different But whatever it is, whatever it is that God is telling you, whatever it is that he's saying to you, be open to that and be obedient and listen and just move forward in that and the blessings will come. From our old, he's trying to move us from our old ways to his new ways, from our past to our future, from our old ways of thinking to his new ways of thinking. I'm telling you, church, listen, we got to deal with our old ways of thinking. We have to. If we don't, we're going to be stuck there. We're going to be stuck and calcified. And that's not a life for a Christian. That is not what God created us to be. He created us to be free and to be moving forward in all, in everything that he has for us. Philippians 13, verse, uh, sorry, Philippians 3 Verses 13 to 14 says, No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it, but I focus on this one thing. This is the one thing that Paul focuses on. Forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. What lies ahead? Pressing, press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Jesus Christ, is calling us. You see, we need to be a church with conviction. We need to be a people of conviction, godly conviction. We, and we need to be a church that refuses to be stuck and wherever it is and whatever it is, that's sticking us, all right? We, we, we need to refuse to do that and to be there. And yes, I know, I understand that we've all had challenges we, in our lives. We all have. We all have. None of us are exempt. I know that there has been trauma in our lives. I know that there has been bitterness and unforgiveness. Each and every one of us have been there. I know that there's offenses and there is disappointment. We've all felt that every one of us. There's been discouragement and there's been disillusionment. I don't deny any of those things. We all have, have, have had those and had to deal with them. I get it. And this doesn't mean that we pretend that these things didn't happen. That's not what I'm asking you to do. All right? What I'm saying here is that there, this, it does, there's a life beyond your past. 
There is a life beyond your circumstances and things that have happened to you, all right? Your history does not define who you are, all right? And it doesn't define your destiny, the destiny that God has for you. How much do we really, really want Jesus in our life? How much are we yearning for him and want want him in our lives and to work through our lives? Who is our hope? if it's not Jesus. Amen? How much do we value our relationship with God over the worldly things and concerns? Okay? Um, Worldly things can be anything that takes our primary focus away from God. It's what we dwell on. It's what consumes us day in, day out. And it's sometimes it's the reason why we can't sleep at night. All right? Those are worldly concerns. Our world is shifting, and the shaking is happening. God is shifting and shaking things everywhere. This world is different today than what it's ever been, all right? And it's moving forward quicker and quicker, all right? We're doing things today on a wide scale that was done in Sodom and Gomorrah, that was done in Israel, in, in Jerusalem. We're doing things today that, that far, go far beyond what was happening in those days, at least on a greater level, all right? Um, and God is, is, God is shaking things up, and he's, 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 he's doing things. And we need, to, we need to be on board. We need to be, to be subjective to what God is doing in our lives, and, and able to listen and hear what it is that he wants to do, how he wants to change us, and how he wants to move us forward. What are we longing for? What are we desiring for in our lives? Lot's wife's attachment to the past was greater than her commitment to the future. Her attachment to the past was greater than her commitment to the future. She wanted what, was, what she was leaving way more than what God had for her in her future. We need to be careful, church. We need to be careful that we're not so busy looking back and longing for the old that we knew, all right, and move and, stop and, and, and not be moving forward in the blessings and the future that God has for us. God is trying to burn up things in your life. So the question is, what is God trying to burn up in your life? But you keep dragging it out of the fire. God's trying to burn it up. He's putting it in the fire, but we keep going in and we keep taking it back. Because that's where our mindset is. All right? You keep resurrecting that thing. Is it the disappointment? Is it discouragement? Is it offense? Is it bitterness? Is it unforgiveness? Is it betrayal? Is it hurt and pain? We don't know. It's all different for every one of us. We go through different seasons in our life. Well, here's what I say. I say, let it burn. Let it burn. Don't be taking it out of the fire. Let it burn there and let God consume it because that's what he wants to do. That's who God is. He's a consuming fire. And he wants to burn up those things in our life that need to be burned up. But we sometimes so desperately hang on to them and we don't see the best that God has for us. We need to let those things burn. It's time to let go of the past, church. It's time to be, start focusing on the future and it's time to start trusting God for his provisions in our life. It's time to press on. And to learn, or to lean, I'm sorry, into God and what God has for us. The best that he has for us. Jesus warns us, things are going to get intense. They are. He warns us of this. It isn't a matter of if things get intense. Things are going to get intense. Things are going to look really bad sometimes in our life. Things, there is going to be disappointment in our lives. But don't look back. Don't look back at those things. Don't look back at not just those things, but don't look back at when better days and, oh, I wish it was this and I wish it was that. I'm telling you, God is doing something in those disappointments. 
God is doing something in the bad. God is doing something in, in the intensity of what's going on in your life. There's something that he's doing in that. Are you willing to surrender it to him? Are you willing to let it go? Are you willing to let it burn up and give it to God, surrender it to him? Remember Lot's wife. Remember Lot's wife. Don't long for the things that God is burning up in your life. All right? Trust that God is making room for something new for you. Because he is. He wants, he's got better for you. He has a destiny for you that he wants to move you into. Trust that God is making room for that something new in your life. Fire promotes new growth. We all know that. This is why we do, we, people that work with, I don't know, forestry and all that stuff, they burn things. Why? Because it opens up room for new growth. All right? So fire promotes new growth. Fire burns up the old and it makes room for the new. Fire makes the ground fertile. Fire makes the ground fertile so that you can receive and grow. God has such a glorious plan for your life. Such a glorious plan for your life. Jesus has a life beyond the past for you, for each and every one of us. So I declare that we will be a church who models this. I declare that we will be a church who trusts in God more than we trust in our past. I will, that we will be a church who pours into the next generation so that we can raise them up and grow them up in maturity so that things will go well for them in their life. So I pray and I decree that there will be signs and wonders, that they will be a normal thing of this church. That signs and wonders will be a normal thing. That healings will be a normal thing in this church. I declare this right now in the name of Jesus. Why? Because I'm looking forward. I'm looking forward to what God is doing. I'm looking forward to what he's, what he's going to do in this place and in this community. Amen? Because we're not looking back. That is not who we are. We're not a people who look back at City Gate Church. We are a people who look forward. We look past. Our past is behind us. And God is before us. We look into the future. We're not into the future, but we look to the future and what God has for us. And we trust in God's promises. Amen? Why? Because that's who we are. That's who we are. And you may not feel like that right now. You may not feel that's who you are right now, but you believe that's who you are and that's who God created you to be. And he did. He's just burning up things in your life so that eventually you will feel like that. And you'll believe it because you'll be acting out that way. That will be your normal, your normal way of acting and believing. Because he is mighty and powerful and he lives in us and he lives through us. That's who we are. Amen? Amen? Amen. Well, Father, we thank you, Lord. We thank you, Father, that you are way bigger than our problems. You are way bigger than our past. You're way bigger than the things that consume us. Lord, you are an amazing God, and you want the best for us. Father, I pray a blessing over each and every one listening to this word today. And I pray that it goes deep, and I pray, Father, that you will start to move in a mighty way in their lives. And, Father, that they will start to catch this revelation, Lord, that those who are, that they'll just give them the ability, Lord, to surrender everything to you. And, Father, that you might have your way in their lives, Lord, that you might be able to um, open their heart and their eyes and their spirit, Lord, to the, to the amazing destiny that you have for them, Lord. Father, we, won't, we, won't, we don't see it now, but, Lord, we trust in you for it. Lord, and we just we trust in you, and we, and, we, and we give everything to you. We lay everything at the foot of the cross, and we say, Lord, have your way in our hearts and in our souls, and we give you the praise and the glory, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.